Hiya! This is a full one hour video about JoJo's Bizarre Adventure Trivia. It's one part of an ongoing series where I meticulously dive into the niche aspects of one of my favorite anime and manga franchises of all time. If you haven't already, you can check out the other videos on a playlist linked down below. But in today's video, we're really starting to get obscure. So buckle yourself in and be prepared, moron. Because today, we're getting deep into the JoJo's Bizarre Adventure iceberg. Oh yeah, and also, today's video is sponsored by Incogni. Stay tuned to hearn- to hearn more. <laughs> hearn more! <laughs> PS2 Corruptions in late December of 2016, YouTube user Teso Teragoya began uploading a series of game corruption videos focused on the JoJo Part 5 PS2 video game. In the series, Teragoya plays through the super story mode of the game, but with a bunch of corruptions and custom mods sprinkled throughout. This includes some little things like audio playing randomly during cutscenes or gameplay, or more complex things like entire textures, models, and images being swapped, edited, or even overlaid on top of each other. Each other. The videos also include entirely new scenes made just for the series, either to convey events from the manga not included in the original game's story, or as a side gag of sorts. The most famous example of the many strange corruptions in this series is the top of Bruno's hair being recolored to the same tone as his skin, making him look like he's completely bald. The series concluded in late May of 2020, spawning many pieces of fan art, cosplay, and even AMVs throughout the JoJo fandom. I remember distinctly seeing clips and images of these videos being spread around online like crazy when they were happening. They really left an intriguing mark on the JoJo community overall. I love coconuts. I'm gonna be real with you, uh, we're pretty deep into the iceberg at this point, and I have no idea as to why this subject is listed so late into this. This feels like something that I think everybody should be aware of at this point if you just watched or read JoJo, but it's here, so uh, we gotta cover it, I guess. In part three, when Kakyoin is impersonated by Rubber Soul and his stand Yellow Temperance, the guy exhibits a lot of really strange behavior, which should immediately tip viewers off to the fact that he is not who he says he is. One of these strange slip-ups is when he eats an entire rhinoceros beetle, covering up his extremely gross craving by stating, Hmm, tasty. I love them. Coconuts, that is. The kid from part three, Anne, even sees the beetle in his mouth, but assumes that since he was just holding a coconut drink, she must have just mistaken the sight of a coconut shell for something else. Because of course, why why would you not mistake the sight of like a rhinoceros beetle for coconut? I fucking hate kids, dumb fucks. <laughs> <laughs> I guess I should just expect this sort of thing at this point. Whatever. Either way, this man is sad, strange, little, and most importantly, he has my pity. Tenmei Kakyoin even though Kakyoin's official name is Noriaki, as in Noriaki Kakyoin, this wasn't actually Araki's original intention for the character. In Jojonium Volume 12, Araki explained that his name was originally supposed to be Tenmei, and Araki himself still calls Kakyoin by this name to this day. The change actually came about because of a miscommunication between Araki and his editor, as the kanji for Kakyoin's name can be read as both Noriaki and as Tenmei. Traces of this change still remain in the manga itself, too, as when Kakyoin signs into Enya's hotel register during the Justice arc, he signs it as Tenmei Kakyoin. If you think that this is a one-off situation, you'd actually be wrong. A similar event occurred with a much more recent character originating from Part 8, Kei Nijimura. Her name was mistakenly printed as Kyo during her introduction, but upon the publishing of Chapter 102, Araki came forward and properly corrected the mistake, clarifying the discrepancy in a proper author's note. So it's kind of interesting, the mistake with Kakyoin ended up making it his permanent canon name, but the mistake with K actually was reversed and she went back to being K. Just goes to show, everybody makes mistakes. Even the creator of one of the most beloved manga series of all time. And speaking of mistakes, the internet. The internet can sometimes feel like a mistake, especially when it comes to your privacy. 
Yeah, yeah, you like that transition? <laughs> Bet you do. Being online is great, but sometimes it just kind of feels like a very murky place to exist, especially with predatory companies that go about collecting and trading your personal data completely out of your own control. I found out that 72 data brokers had my personal information stored somewhere without me even realizing it. And I had no idea how to reckon with that. Listen, dude, I can barely eat three meals a day. You expect me to trace back my information to all 72 of those groups? That's like, no. Which is why I'm actually very excited for today's sponsor, Incognate. Incognate is a new service that helps you shield your privacy and reaches out to these data aggregation companies so you don't have to. Instead of having to manually track down each and every person who has your data, which can be a, a whole thing? Incogni does all that work for you and helps scrub your personal information from places you don't want it to be. You guys know me, I like to be mostly anonymous online, so this sort of stuff is a complete nightmare for me. I get unrelated spam on my personal email all the time because everybody's passing around my information like a hot potato. And oh my god, there was this really, really bad case where someone was actually able to impersonate a family member of mine over the phone once using the private information that is sold off to people by these companies. So yeah, Incogni, big help. Their website is also really easy to use and understand. Like I said, I have trouble just kind of existing. So having a more simplified user interface that is easy to understand at a glance is very helpful. Plus, if you want more detailed info, there's an entire page with explicit information about who exactly has your info, how confidential it is, and the progress on removing it. So, if this sort of service interests you as much as it does for me, you can go to incogni.com slash saltydkdan and use code saltydkdan to get an exclusive offer of 60% off. That's incogni.com slash saltydkdan and use code saltydkdan or or click the link below to start taking your personal data off of the market. Anyway, big thanks to Incogni for helping support the channel. And now, back to Jojo Iceberg Real 2024. Araki is Christian. I'm a Christian now. The many references to Christianity and biblical canon within Jojo's Bizarre Adventure has given rise to this joking claim of Iraqi's religious beliefs. From the more obvious, like the appearance of Jesus Christ in Part 7 as a pivotal character, to the more underhanded references, like Diavolo's mysterious virgin birth. Christianity has a surprising amount of imagery and symbolism littered throughout the JoJo franchise. This underlying theme was actually elaborated on by Araki himself in an interview with Kaneko Kazuma. Araki alludes to the fact that his personal beliefs are basically along the lines of deism, believing that something exists, if not necessarily a god specifically. He also clarifies that, believe it or not, he went to a Protestant Christian school when he was younger, and ended up reading the Bible every day back then, leading to the multiple references and undertones throughout Jojo. So basically, Araki isn't actually Christian, he just has a lot of Christian influences based on events from his childhood. He just looked at the Bible and was like, yo, this is sick, but what if I incorporated it into a multi-generational manga story about a bunch of guys named Jojo? I think that that would be neat. And then he did it. <laughs> Name changes. This entry could be referring to two separate talking points. So instead of assuming which one it is, I'm instead going to talk about both separately. Because, as I discussed before, I have zero self-control with this video. Please send help. Localization name changes. I already talked about some of this when discussing Deadly Queen near the beginning of the iceberg, but I want to talk about it again with a little more depth. Also, it's my video and I do what I want, bitch. But that does not change the fact that I need help. Please send help. When Jojo finally acquired an official English localization, many of its more direct musical references were edited or flat out changed. While these alterations were most prominently featured in the English dub of the anime, they also noticeably affected the original English sub of the anime, the manga, and the video games. There hasn't been an official statement on why these changes were necessary, but it's pretty easy to put the pieces together. I doubt that Viz Media 
media or any license holder would want to risk any sort of legal action in regards to copyright infringement. While some people might enjoy their work being referenced in the series, many probably would not. I'm unsure if there's any actual looming threat over JoJo's head copyright wise, but I don't blame anyone for wanting to take the safer route, with substitution names instead of direct original references. Unfortunately, the negative effect that this has over the series is much more widely visible than the positive one, and while many of the new names are fine as they are, some of them they're just not really good. As an example, just in case you don't know what I'm talking about, one of my least favorites has to be the new name given to Bruno Stand from Part 5. In the original Japanese manga, the Stand was named Sticky Fingers. This is an extremely blunt reference to the album of the same name created by the Rolling Stones. Something I find really cool is that the actual original album was manufactured with a physical zipper on the front that you could zip open and close. It doesn't do anything specifically, but it's a really fun tactile addition, and you can directly see how Araki was inspired by it when creating the stand. Just like the album of the same name, the stand is also associated with zippers, and uses them not only on its design for flair, but as a part of its main power set, being able to zip and unzip various objects and solid material. A stand's namesake doesn't always have this much influence over the stand itself, but in this case you can see how tied together everything really is. I love this sort of thing. So imagine my surprise when the English dub changed the stand's name to Zipper Man. Why would you do this? It sounds like a slur. Zipper Man is a name that not only sounds less cool than Sticky Fingers, but is just a literal interpretation of what the stand is. Absolutely no subtlety whatsoever. I'm just not a fan of this at all. Again, to be fair, I don't blame anyone for these changes. I totally recognize that getting JoJo like this is much better than getting no JoJo at all. But I am going to make fun of it mercilessly. Because come on, l l let's be real here. Some of these are really dumb. However, and I'm willing to fully admit it, there is a silver lining to all this. As while some of the name changes are just kinda eh, others are, quite honestly, fucking hilarious. Like, in the video game Eyes of Heaven, Limp Bizkit from Part 6 was renamed to Flaccid Pancake. I reiterate, Flaccid Pancake. You could just tell that they were like, fuck it, name it the opposite of what it is. That's the sort of name stuff that I actually really like. Oh, and lest we not forget the greatest name change of all time, where they changed the name of the Part 7 stand, Dirty Deeds Done Dirt Cheap, into Filthy Acts at a reasonable price. That right there is a great example of taking lemons and turning them into lemonade. If you have to change it that drastically, just make it funny, why not? At least that's what I think. In my opinion, it just makes them more memorable. Manga Name Changes If you think that the name change thing is exclusive to the Western release of the series, here's a shocker. It actually isn't, but for different reasons. In the original Japanese publication of the manga, there have been a couple of situations where the names of stands were changed for one reason or another. The two most significant examples being the ones present in Part 6 and Part 8. In the first weekly Shonen Jump release of Stone Ocean, the stand Planet Waves was originally called Earth, Wind, and Fire. Despite this, however, this same name was actually already taken by another ability present in Part 4, the same one used by self-proclaimed alien Mikitaka Hasekura. With this being the case, the decision was made to rename it to Planet Waves, and later go on to change it in all reprints of the chapters going forward. Later on down the road, a similar switch up was made with Kei Nijimura's stand from Part 8. That's right, we're talking about Kei Nijimura and name changes again. I, I, that's 
crazy. When it was first revealed, Kay's stand ability was actually named Going Underground, named after a song by an English band called The Jam. This would remain the case until the release of the Volume 4 Tankabon, where it was instead renamed to Born This Way, inspired by Lady Gaga. This change was made for a currently unknown reason, and while the stand would remain with its new name, Kay's design would stay the same. The reason that this is peculiar is because Kay's hat has the letters GU on the front, which still references the original name of the stand, Going Underground. Next up, another entry read by Binjo Monkey. JoJo's Bizarre Adventure, Last Survivor. Japan-exclusive arcade games and even Japan-exclusive JoJo games are nothing particularly new. That being said, it's still incredibly saddening to know that we outside of Japan will not get a chance anytime soon to play JoJo's Bizarre Adventure Last Survivor. This game is no joke, a battle royale game featuring JoJo characters. The game is pretty successful within its home country, so it seems that it's still being supported. This could mean the idea of a port to consoles isn't totally out of the question, but nothing of the sort has been officially discussed. We'll just have to wait and see if we too can chug jug with Dio sometime in the near or far future. Phantom Blood PS2 Game Much like Part 5, the seminal JoJo entry, Phantom Blood, also has a PS2 action-adventure game adaptation. Developed by Anchor Inc. and published by Bandai, it was released in Japan only on October 26th of 2006, coinciding with the series' 20th anniversary. In the game, you fight hand-to-hand -hand battles in free-roaming arenas for the most part, with the game's story being divided into chapters and different playable characters throughout. Overdrive moves can be performed using the heat gauge, which builds up when damage is inflicted on enemies, but lowers when the player takes damage. Stamina can also be built up by performing various JoJo poses. The story is pretty faithfully represented with a few caveats, like Danny's death, Dio hiding a knife from George, the the inspector's flashback and his death, and the entire character of Father Styx being omitted. Unfortunately though, despite the game's attention to detail and unique mechanic concepts, it's pretty widely regarded as a bad game. Stiff, janky, repetitive, boring, and glitchy is not something any game worth its salt wants to be described as, and Phantom Blood on the PS2 has heard its fair share of those complaints. And yet, the quality notwithstanding, there are a couple of aspects of the game that are fairly compelling. The first and most memorable being that the game features voice acting from the cast of the Lost Phantom Blood anime movie, meaning that this game is one of the only surviving pieces of their performances that hasn't been lost to time. Given how much intrigue has been collected about the movie over the years, that's actually really cool. It's like you can look up a playthrough of it, close your eyes, and pretend the movie is right in front of you. You just need to use your imagination. The second point of intrigue about the game is that it features a couple of alternate story routes. Depending on how you do in certain fights, slightly different events can occur. For example, early on in Phantom Blood's story, Jonathan and Dio have a boxing match surrounded by schoolyard kids. In the manga, Jonathan loses this fight due to Dio cheating, and goes on to be shunned by his peers. But if the player can actually manage to win this fight in-game, this time Dio will lose, but instead accuse Jonathan to be the one who cheats. While none of these differences in plot change the grand scheme of things, they're still pretty rad to bring up and talk about. Since Phantom Blood is the shortest of all of the parts, it's always fun to see it get any sort of new content. Alex Ryder when you think of Hirohiko Araki's illustration work, what immediately comes to mind aside from Jojo? Maybe Bao? Maybe his many Rohan one-shots? How about a series of British spy novels? No? Well, weirdly enough, that last one is true. Alex Ryder is a series of spy novels written by British author Anthony Horowitz, and stars a teenage spy named, what else, Alex Ryder. The series is 13 novels long, and is basically aimed at a young adult crowd. 
The books dive into all sorts of crazy topics like family intrigue, conspiracy, chemical warfare, and also strange science fiction at times. The reason this matters to Araki is because when these books were released in Japan, he did various illustrations for all of them, and they're actually pretty snazzy looking. Sure, he makes Alex look a lot more like a strange JoJo character than he would otherwise, but is that really a bad thing? I think not. Speaking of strange though, the series also underwent a bit of a name change in Japan. Or I guess you could call it more of a name extension of sorts. Instead of just Alex Ryder, it was instead called Her Majesty the Queen's Boy Spy Alex Ryder, which is certainly a mouthful. I guess if they didn't specify that he was Her Majesty the Queen's boy spy, you wouldn't know he was British. Big shout out to Japan for the trigger warning. I hate British people. Love Note For this entry in specific, we're gonna have to rewind a bit and talk about Araki's interview with Shoko Nakagawa I brought up earlier on this iceberg. As a refresher, Shoko is a popular personality in Japan as well as a massive JoJo fan, and she has made it insanely well known how much she simps for Jotaro Kujo. Honestly dude, same. During a segment of the original webcast, Araki quickly created a joke character as the hypothetical son of Nakagawa and Jotaro Kujo, who, as I said, she majorly simps for. The character, whose name is Joe Kujo, also of course has a stand, which is named Love Note. Love Note is bound to a notebook with the head of Shoko Nakagawa's cat, Mamitas, protruding from the top left of its pages. Its ability is called Till Death Do Us Part, ensuring that whatever pair of people's names are written alongside each other's in the Love Note, they're bound to be married, regardless of their true feelings. As a result, the victims of the stand will often kill each other to be free of its effects. Effect, likening it to another supernatural notebook from manga fame from which the love note is clearly based on. That's right, Araki named the stand after the popular series Death Note, the supernatural thriller by Sugomi Oba and Takeshi Obata, about a high schooler with an edgy goth notebook that kills people whose names are written on the inside. This is just an idea that I had during recording, but I'd love for Araki to create a bunch of stands that's names are references to other manga that are popular in Shonen Jump. Like, I'd love to hear what a stand called Naruto could do, or like a stand called Dragon Ball, where like maybe you could like get a wish or something after collecting a certain amount of items or something like that. I, I would love to see that. Again, that's just something I came up with while I was recording. This is not on the script at all, but I don't know, I think it could be kind of cool. Probably not in the main series, obviously, but just as like, oh, like a fun little extra thing at the end, like, hey, here's some hypothetical stands based off of shonen manga, because why not? All right, next up, we have a new guest narrator that I'm really excited to have the opportunity to have on. His name is Wooly Madden, aka Wooly. You may know him from some of his recent projects like Wooly Versus and the Castle Super Beast podcast, but I've actually been aware of him for a long time prior to those things, and his internet presence was fundamental in a lot of my early experience in the JoJo community. Wooly has a burning passion for this series just as much as anybody else on this iceberg, so I'm just really honestly very excited that I got the chance to kind of go full circle and have him on to talk about some insane JoJo facts with me. But uh, yeah, <laughs> without further fanboying, go right ahead, dude. Enormous rat. JoJo's Bizarre Adventure is no stranger to concerns over content when it comes to overseas releases, whether it be Dio reading the Quran, mosques being seen in property damage scenes, or even just simple things like copyright concerns when it comes to certain stand names. There's quite a history of trouble when it comes to the matter of JoJo localization. When it comes to censorship though, one particularly strange and hilarious instance is in the original English release of the Part 3 manga by Viz Media in 2005. As we all know, Araki loves to punish every dog that graces the pages of his magnum opus. As soon as they wag that tail and trapes forward with their little paws, he's already planning exactly how and when they're going to be gruesomely destroyed. But in America, few other animals invoke that familiar comfort of a furry best friend quite like a dog does. So perhaps that's why when Stardust Crusaders was first set to make its English debut, all of Araki's patented dog takedowns were changed 
to giant rats. This is not a joke. Every single dog that bites the dust in the pages of part three's first English translation were all transformed into rats. This led to some particularly hilarious dialogue changes like, who put that enormous rat's corpse in front of my house? Suffice it to say, this didn't end up affecting the story much, but it's still a hilarious odd piece of Jojo history nonetheless. I suppose that since we're more used to killing rats in American households, that must have been the logic that they went with for the replacement. But it definitely doesn't explain why they're so gigantic. Yeah, no, they they are very, very large. I really don't know what they were thinking with that. But anyway, yeah, let's uh, let's stop talking about rats and move on. Rats, we're rats, we're the what do you think? You're funny, putting putting Germa rat meme on the screen. It's unfunny. You're you're literally unfunny. Actually, die. Uber fan. Welcome to the Uber fan tier. If you made it this far, congratulations! Your friends and family no longer hate you. However, they are concerned for your well-being. Your quest to know everything there is to know about Jojo has spiraled you into a deep, dark hole of which there is no longer a way out of. So come on, journey with me further into the abyss of obscure anime trivia. Jojo Part 4 Drama CDs Ever heard of drama CDs? Yes? No? Well, plenty of anime and manga series have them. They're essentially CD releases that act as audio dramas or radio plays of the series they're adapting. Sometimes these can just be fun side stories, or in some cases they can adapt an entire story wholesale, like in the case of Higurashi when they cry drama CDs, or True Story, a few select fights and arcs from Stardust Crusaders. Diamond is Unbreakable got to share in the audio drama goodness too in 2016 and 2017. The 6th and 13th volumes of the limited edition Blu-ray sets of the anime contained extra content that took the form of drama CDs. The set featured two exclusive original stories set within the canon of Part 4, and featuring its already established cast of characters. In a way, I guess you can consider these sort of like bonus filler episodes of D.I.U., except the fact that they're both just audio only with no visuals. Of course, this was only in the Japanese release of the anime, so these haven't been released in English in any sort of official capacity. Although despite this, however, fan translations of their content can be found online so you can still experience their stories as an English-only speaker. Or I guess in this case, English reader, because you're gonna be reading a lot of text with some audio in the background, I... I, I guess. The first story focuses on Josuke, Okuyasu, and Koichi looking into a local ghost story, and actually takes place a few days after the events of the arc Rohan Kashibe's adventure. The story tells of a skilled piano playing girl who gets caught in a tragic car accident. Though she survives the crash, her hands are damaged beyond repair, never to play the piano ever again. Soon after the fact, on a rainy night, the girl um, content warning, unalives herself from the music room window on her school's fourth floor. The person telling the ghost story to the gang happens to be Okuyasu, and Josuke tells him to can it with the Scooby-Doo business. But Koichi actually believes it, listening further as Okuyasu describes how a student named Owada encountered the girl's spirit while getting supplies from the school at night. Deciding that it may be prudent to investigate ghostly business with their recent discovery of Raimi and the serial killer and Morio, they decide to investigate the high school just in case. Shenanigans obviously ensue. I actually really like this setup and how it ties into the story of part 4. It's really cool that because this radio drama takes place in like the middle of part 4, they tried to connect it a little bit with the currently going on events, and to me at least, it feels a lot more organic and cool because of it. Like, yeah, of course they're gonna go investigate this ghostly vision when they literally just met a ghost the other day. Anyway, moving on, the second story is really cute. It focuses on Josuke and Koichi trying to give Okuyasu relationship advice 
over a waitress he's apparently fallen in love with. Apparently, she was nice to him one time when it was about to rain, and ever since, he's had a massive crush. Ordering some drinks, the boys sit at one of the tables at the cafe she works at to discuss approaches. They even attempt to roleplay a conversation to give Okuyasu an idea of what to say, but their scene setup is just so elaborate and violent seeming that other clients begin to leave the cafe, so they decide the joke has gone too far and they stop. Just like last time, of course, further shenanigans do ensue. I don't want to spoil either of these if you want to give them a read or listen because it's pretty rare to get extra stories of the characters of part 4. Not to self-promote myself or anything like that, but I actually attempted to animate the opening monologue of the first drama CD in this set a few years ago when it first released. Normally, I'd probably just drop a link in the description below and call it a day, however, while I was writing this script, I discovered that somebody not only had the same idea as me, but ended up doing it way better. Rona67 on YouTube animated the first four and a half minutes of the original drama CD, and even worked amazingly within their limitations by using cute chibi versions of the main characters instead of full anime accurate animation. I love this fan made video and very much suggest checking it out. Just like everything else, link will be in the description. Morio Tourist On the first page of chapter 377 of the manga, or chapter 112 of Diamond is Unbreakable, we see a particularly funny looking tourist guy hanging out in Morio. He has a huge tennis racket, several bags strapped to his back, hip sunglasses, a hat swarmed with dozens of button pins, and a big old smile that says, You'll never find the bodies. This guy was obviously ripe for meme status as soon as the fans got a hold of him and reposted his image online. The jokes about his appearance write themselves, frankly. This means that, much like Kira's co-worker, his importance has been elevated to comedic heights in Japanese fan work and memes alike. It's always cool that little background characters like this can develop their own niche online followings and weird lore, but also, this guy has definitely done some crimes. And quite honestly, I'm a little frightened of him. Gappy saved Josuke Long ago, it was initially speculated by a large group of fans that the man who saved and inspired Josuke as a baby was, in fact, supposed to be an older Josuke, who was somehow inexplicably hurled back in time during his encounter with Bites the Dust. This was never confirmed to be the case in actuality, despite it being a popular theory, and although many believe it was Araki's original plan that he had dropped later on, he's actually outright denied that this was ever the case. However, this is the JoJo fandom, so of course, the theory would not only continue to spread, but somehow get even more and more psychotic, which is the subject of this topic. Given that this theory has still circulated all these years since Part 4's original publication, a newer version of this theory posits that somehow, Josuke from Part 8 Jojolian was the one who actually saved Part 4 Josuke in the first place that somehow, the man who saved baby Josuke from the snowstorm wasn't future Josuke, but instead, his own doppelganger, appearing from an alternate reality instead of traveling through time. Since Steel Ball Run and Jojolian introduced the concept of alternate realities to the original Jojo canon, I guess this is something that could be technically possible? I mean, there's sort of a precedent for this, particularly with the knowledge that Funny Valentine's alternate reality abilities are something capable of manifesting in a stand user. However, this crackpot theory is far less plausible now that Part 8 has officially concluded. Unless Josuke somehow comes back in Part 9, I guess. I, I wouldn't know this video is being made before that even comes out. Of course, even if this did end up somehow being the case, this would mean that at some point, Part 8 Josuke would decide to rock a cool looking pompadour for some reason. So we can really only speculate as to why he would do something like that if at all. Maybe it's some sort of elaborate disguise. It wouldn't be the first time that a JoJo utilized one for an important mission. If you want my two cents, this theory and its original version have always sort of been massive reaches in my opinion. Araki has never planned that super far ahead before, and isn't really the type of author to make massive earth-shattering retcons. 
looks. Don't get me wrong here, I totally understand why this misconception exists. I believed this theory when I first heard it when I was reading the manga. Everything about it just seemed too perfect and open-ended to not somehow have been planned. However, we have to keep in mind that not only has Araki outright said that this wasn't going to be the case and was never planned to be, but the story itself is being told from Koichi's perspective. Of course, the guy would probably look like an older Josuke in his mind. It, that makes sense. I know a lot of people seem to point out the specific injuries that this random dude has and how they're similar to the ones that Josuke received from Kira later Later in part 4, but they aren't. They're not similar at all, really. I'm fairly certain that Josuke's savior has injuries in the story to properly showcase his good Samaritan nature despite being a delinquent. This then later informs Josuke's character throughout part 4. American readers and viewers tend to forget this, but Josuke is a delinquent. It's a part of his character. But not only that, he's a kind-hearted delinquent. That sort of contrast is a really big part of who he is. It doesn't necessarily match up with his outward appearance, and that's what makes him so interesting. You know, among other things. This past event where a random bystander, a delinquent, helped Josuke out of the snow and prevented him from dying, despite having the absolute shit beaten out of them? This is the reason that Josuke grows up to be such an upstanding citizen, to be such a good guy, and sets up why he cares so much about saving people, as well as his hair that he modeled after the guy. It's just a bonus that Josuke's pompadour is also involved in this backstory. Story. I know it doesn't seem like a lot, but sometimes Araki's bizarre storytelling is actually just normal storytelling. Alright, it's time for another guest entry, this time read by Viva once again. Take it away! Koichi was cut from Pod 5 PS2 game. In footage from early builds of the Pod 5 video game on PS2, Koichi from Pod 4 also seems to make an appearance, similarly to how he appeared in early chapters of the story before the main plotline kicked off. Koichi and Echo's Act 3 even have fully completed models that were never used in the final build. The reason why it was dropped from the game completely before its release is unknown, but maybe it had something to do with the fact that, aside from a brief role at the beginning of the part, Koichi doesn't really stick around for very long or make much of a difference to the larger plot. That being said, he does still feature in an audio drama that was included with the game's soundtrack. In this brief appearance, and only in this brief appearance, he is voiced by Ryo Natsuki, who also voiced Trish in the game, as well as Lulu in Final Final Fantasy X, Miyako Inoue in Digimon Adventure 02, and Wanda in the Japanese dub of the Fairly Odd Parents. Yeah, seriously! At one point, Koichi and Wanda shared a voice actress. The more you know. Muda.swf in the early days of the English JoJo fandom, there were a lot of obscure entry points into the franchise because of the Wild West nature of the early internet. One of those entry points was a Flash animation simply titled Muda.SWF, which is of course named after Dio Brando's famous battle cry. The Flash animation features stick figure representations of Giorno, Bruno, Narancha, Jotaro, and Dio all fighting with their stands in various action scenes. It uses audio assets sourced from the PS2 Part 5 game and the arcade classic Heritage for the Future, and was created by Japanese user QuareQuare1234, originally posted on their now defunct personal website. The earliest known source for it that I could find appears to be an archived 2ch.net thread, compiling different kinds of flash animations, dated in July of 2003, which links back to that site. It's basically just a stick figure JoJo tribute animation, but it's cool to imagine that a lot of English fans who had never heard of JoJo before got into it simply because of this video. It just goes to show that internet oddities have always fascinated us and made us want to learn more about whatever they're from. Yeah, the internet is neat. Okay, I know it's so soon after, but uh, here's some more guest entries. This first one being read by Pigpen. He has a really good channel and actually does similar icebergs just like the one you're watching right now. So if that sounds interesting to you, then you can find his stuff in the description below alongside everybody else's. The Bottle. Everybody gets their start somewhere, and of the several one-shot stories created by Araki in the time before JoJo, one of the earliest by far was a manuscript titled The Bottle. Unfortunately, unlike several other of Araki's early works, this one has never been released fully to the public, aside from a few pictures and comments. 
The story was submitted by Araki for the 14th Tezuka Award under the pen name Toshi Arakino when he was only 17 years old, and was only mentioned publicly once in the first 1978 issue of Weekly Shonen Jump. The story was discussed briefly by Hiroshi Motomiya, who was a judge for the awards at the time, and he seemed to like it quite a bit. No one is capable of being an independent manga artist unless they have a story with originality, Motomiya said. Out of these, I'm interested in seeing an original story from the artist of The Bottle. Considering his age, it's safe to say this artist is a very smart and promising newcomer. And oh boy, how right would he prove to be, huh? It'd be pretty cool if this story was ever fully revealed to the public someday. But for now, we'll just have to wonder about what it could be like. Also, once again, we have H-Squid coming back for an entry. So make sure to open your ears and your brain to, <laughs> to, <laughs> to this guest entry. Oh my God, I'm gonna, I'm gonna die. Roses and heritage for the future. Susie Q's butler in part three isn't exactly a common fan favorite character you'd expect to see on many people's lists. However, this guy, whose actual name is Roses, was initially planned to be in the part three video game Heritage for the Future. In a secret file booklet looking at the behind the scenes process for many different Capcom games at the time, concept art for Sprites of Roses could be found, though it's unknown how far into development he was before he was scrapped from the plans. In addition to Roses, concept art for the Pillar Men and even Stroheim are also featured in the booklet. Maybe these additions were cut for the sake of streamlining the game or making it more obviously part three centric, but either way, it's still fun to speculate about what these character additions could have been like. It's definitely weird to think about Rose's fighting though, if he was intended to be playable. That means that conceivably someone could beat Dio playing as Rose's. Actually, that sounds kind of hilarious. Capcom, don't worry about a new Mega Man. Just please tell us when we'll be able to play as Rose's. It's okay if you don't have an answer right this second. I'll wait. I got time. Skywalker Sound. So, you guys know Star Wars, right? Little known series, you might not have heard of it until now. Pretty niche. It was made by this guy named, uh, Georgi Lucas. It's pretty cool, pretty weird, and obviously the best character in it by far is Dexter Jetster. Thank you for listening to my super unfunny bit. I will be taking no criticisms and no notes. Fuck you. But all that aside, the parent company of the franchise, Lucasfilm, has their own entire sound effects, editing, design, mixing, and music recording division, which was founded in 1975, and is named Skywalker Sound. Named after, well, you know, who else? Han Solo. Anywho, they did all of the sound work for the Star Wars series, and even the infamous holiday special. So obviously their resume was looking pretty good, all things considered. Thus, naturally, a lot of people wanted to hire them and outsource their sound mixing work for various projects. So what do you think they got hired to mix that might be relevant to this iceberg? That's right. Howard the Duck, but also the 1993 JoJo OVA. Yeah, no joke. All of the sound mixing work in Studio APPP's adaptation of Stardust Crusaders was handled by the Star Wars guys. And if I can be frank, it kind of shows because the sound design is pretty excellent. They actually also went on to do sound mixing for that Phantom Blood film adaptation. You know, the one that's still lost to time. I want you to really think about that for a second. A division of Lucasfilm not only worked on JoJo projects, but also a piece of lost media. That's crazy to me. Just gonna add that to the ever-growing list of interesting ties the JoJo franchise has to famous brands and pop cultural icons, I guess. Mikitaka is Cars. JoJo fan theories are nothing particularly new to us at this point, obviously, but a particularly out there one is that Mikitaka, the lovable ambiguously an alien guy from part four, might actually be an amnesiac version of the main antagonist of part two, Battle Tendency, Cars, the ultimate life form. And unlike other theories that get pretty out there, this one is pretty deranged and I'm fully on board because of that. It's just so insane that I want it to be real so bad. So let's take a moment and break it all down. 
At the end of part two, Cars is defeated by Joseph Joestar after he's catapulted into space and the built up air within his body freezes him in his attempt to launch back to Earth. There and then, he becomes trapped in space for all of eternity. Half mineral, half organic, unable to truly ever die until he finally stops thinking. And uh, look, I know that Cars is like a bad dude, but this is a horrifying way to go out. In this fan theory, it's proposed that the frozen cars eventually landed on some kind of alien planet, wherein somehow he was then thawed from his slumber. Having been near catatonic for so long, he would have lost his memory and all sense of himself, which would make him come to believe that he was actually one of those very aliens on the planet, and then presumably somehow come to Earth again after that and take up the name of Mikitaka. Now, obviously there's no canonical confirmation of anything like this happening, and it's uncertain whether or not it's even a likely possibility when it comes to Araki's authorial intentions. Still, it is worth noting that Mikitaka's abilities to transform his body could be seen as somewhat similar to Kars' abilities when he was using the Redstone of Asia's power, so it's not totally out of the realm of possibility to at least argue the case for. There's probably a lot of stronger JoJo theories out there in general, but god damn it, I love this one. I'm fucking claiming it. Except in my version, uh, there's no aliens. Uh, it's just that Cars goes insane while in space, and then he later crash lands back onto Earth in Japan somehow, and then just kind of convinces himself that he is an alien because he has these weird powers. Basically, I'm keeping the insanity, but I'm getting rid of the actual aliens so that I, I feel like it makes more sense. But in general, though, I, I really like this theory slash head canon, especially since it would mean that Joseph and Cars ended up in the same part of the story again, totally unbeknownst of each other. It's a really out there and weird idea, which I guess, to be fair, fits the spirit of Jojo pretty well. Unused Jotaro Lines in Eyes of Heaven as with any video game, Eyes of Heaven has its fair share of unused content, graphics, and animations. Though by far, some of the most interesting pieces of cut content all relate to Part 6's version of Jotaro Kujo. According to discoveries made by Jojo Wiki co-owner Vish Kujo, the game contains an entire folder of unused dialogue and interactions which make it seem likely that Part 6's version of Jotaro was supposed to be added to the game as a playable character or as some sort of costume. What I think is so fascinating about this beyond the discovery itself is that there's over 30 minutes of unused dialogue that exists in the game's files relating to this incarnation of the character. Spoken of course by Jotaro himself and other characters that would have fought or teamed up with him in the game. If you'd like to listen to them, you can find a great showcase on Vish Kujo's channel, who went about taking the effort to archive them alongside easy to understand visuals. Surprisingly, while a lot of data remains of this addition to the roster, a model of him doesn't actually appear in any of the game's files. Though evidence of this model's existence can be found in the credits images for the game, alongside other Part 6 characters. Space Ripper Stingy Eyes in Part 3 Dio Brando is known for a lot of things. His hilarious catchphrases, his propensity for dropping steamrollers from the sky, and of course, his strange vampiric powers. However, it seemed like after Phantom Blood, a lot of said vampiric powers disappeared from the forefront. Instead, it was more in favor of showing off his stand abilities that he had acquired through the use of the world. This left a few fans a little high and dry when it came to their desire to see him reprise some of those crazy supernatural abilities from days past. Many people were really hoping that he would rip out those crazy laser eyes again, just, just for the fun of it. And thankfully for them, their prayers were actually answered in an unlikely place. In a 1992 audio drama based on Stardust Crusaders, the fight between Jotaro and Dio, like many other parts of the drama, contains a multitude of differences from the original manga. One of those differences would be Dio's use of his Space Ripper Stingy Eyes, which is the ability to shoot pressurized bodily fluids from his eyeballs, similar to that of lasers. It was one of the very same moves utilized against Jonathan way back in Phantom Blood. It's definitely one of Dio's weirder powers, so it's it's pretty cool that it made a return in this fashion, even if it didn't end up being utilized in any other version of this fight. Come on, Rocky, let the man use his laser eyes! 
Eternal come. Yeah, you heard me. Eternal come. Older translations of JoJo parts are rather infamous for the wealth of strange mistranslations that were brought to the table in the process. One such mistranslated element of the series comes in the form of a spoken line by the antagonist of Part 5, Diavolo. The original line takes place during Diavolo's confrontation with Bruno Bucciarati, in which he says, I shall not allow anyone to threaten my everlasting climax. As you can imagine, when you introduce a Google Translate tier machine translation into this equation, the line becomes a bit less than optimal. This led to some translations penning the everlasting climax portion of the line as eternal cum. And unfortunately, or for many, hilariously, depending on how you want to look at it, this problem lingered into the future with the release of the official anime card game in Japan, where many sites would machine translate card titles into English for their sales listings, leading to a card of the same name listed for sale once again as Eternal Cum. Shout out to the 12 year old who shouldn't be watching my content and is laughing their ass off to this specific entry. This, this is a shout out to you. I heard you watch JoJo's Bizarre Adventure. <laughs> I mean, what's really bizarre is the fact you get no bitches. The Lives of Eccentrics. The Lives of Eccentrics is yet another creative project done by Hirohiko Araki, this time a collection of short stories penned between the years of 1989 and 2003 and finally released into a hardcover compilation volume by Shueisha in 2004, with an eventual paperback release following later in 2012. So while the artwork isn't actually done by Araki, it's actually the writing that he takes center stage with. The manga explores, what else, the lives of many famous eccentric people, each chapter featuring a different story, all concluding in one self-contained installment, with the only exception being the story of Ty Cobb, which lasts two chapters. The characters focused on in the manga are actually based on the following real-life figures. Ty Cobb, an American Major League Baseball player, Yoshio Ko, a Chinese-Japanese producer and showman whose dream was to show Japan the weirdest things imaginable, which included, uh, oof, televised relations between a human woman and an alleged human-chimpanzee hybrid? What the fuck? Mary Mallon, an Irish-American woman who was identified as the first asymptomatic carrier of the typhoid fever pathogen, who then proceeded to spread the disease in early 20th century New York. Sarah Winchester, owner of the Winchester Mystery House, who believed the many ghosts of soldiers killed by her father's in-law's rifles, produced by his wealthy manufacturing company, were seeking to kill her, leading to the creation of her continuously built mansion in San Jose, California. The Collier brothers, two Americans known for a nasty hoarding habit and whose many run-ins with thieves targeting their Harlem home lead to them setting up many traps to catch them, and Nikola Tesla, a Serbian-American scientist and engineer best known for his rivalry with Thomas Edison. While the story of each character attempts to keep things relatively respectful to the figures that they're based on, Araki obviously takes some liberties here and there to inject the stories with his typical and unmistakable sense of narrative style. If you can ever get your hands on it, it's an absolutely fascinating read, if nothing else. Eyes of Heaven Tournament like all good fighting games, CyberConnect 2's JoJo's Bizarre Adventure Eyes of Heaven had its own livestream tournament held from November 6th to December 16th of 2015. The event was held to promote the game, much like the previously held JoJo's Bizarre Adventure All-Star Battle League. The tournament was hosted by Bandai Namco producer Noriaki Nino, CyberConnect2 producer Hiroshi Matsuyama, and comedian Kendo Kobayashi. The final round of the tournament was on the stage Air Suplina Island, and was fought between the pairs of Cars and Pet Shop, played by Katen O oh and Kaukawa, and Jolene Kujo and Jairo Zapelli, played by R and Sentasu. The winning team was Cars and Pet Shop, an unlikely pair to be sure, but hey, I can't imagine it's any weirder than JoJo fans are used to. Strange Relation 
The return of obscure older abilities is not the only weird thing the older JoJo drama CDs have going for them. How about we try entirely new characters, for example? Featured only in the second chapter of the first volume of Stardust Crusaders drama CDs, a character simply referred to as Old Man Stand User is the wielder of a stand called Strange Relation. And yes, don't worry, it has the JoJo typical namesake in the form of Strange Relationship, a song originally created created by Prince. Given that his first and only appearance is in this audio drama, you'll have to bear with me because uh, no pictures of this guy or his stand actually exist. And because of that, I thought it would be funny if I had my friend Go Motion edit this specific part of the video because she has never seen JoJo before and I don't really have any visuals anyways, so I, I figure that maybe she can do something with this. <clears throat> The stand itself is bound to a pipe organ, and it can be activated when the user plays said instrument. The sound becomes its means of attack, but it'll become unusable if the user endures psychological damage. It has the powers of manipulation, to touch the hearts of those who hear its haunting melodies and control them, even being able to manipulate multiple people at the same time. However, its weakness is that the effect is broken if the music is too far away for the victim to hear. Strange Relation can also destroy objects through a powerful low sound frequency that can inflict physical damage through its venue. Its user, a random old man, is 89 years old, rather senile, and seems to get a kick out of using his stand to force people to compete with each other. His only motive seems to be just having fun, and he appears to be the only stand user to attack the Crusaders who isn't working for Dio in some capacity. This old dude is only defeated when, taken surprise by Joseph Joestar, he rapidly develops dementia and is forced to retire from the battle. That, uh, whew, that is shockingly dark. Fuck. <laughs> oh my god. Alright, time for another guest entry. This time by another friend of the channel, The Siperior. He does YouTube things on YouTube. Hope you enjoy this guest entry, everyone. Bruto. So many side characters, so little time. That seemed to be something of a motto for David Production when they were getting started on their anime adaptation of Jojo, because, tragically, we lost Bruto in the mix. But who is Bruto, you may ask? Bruto is one of the many people who were outside of the cafe in a part 2 battle tendency, during the fight between Joseph Joestar and Straitso. After Joseph blew up Straitso and the cafe along with him, Bruto attempted to impress a nearby girl by detaining Joseph temporarily. Unfortunately for Bruto, this attempted show of strength quickly fizzled out, as Joseph socked him in the nose and ran off, leaving Bruto clutching his face on the ground while said girl commented on how much cooler Joseph was than him. His name may be a reference to Bluto from Popeye. As previously implied, Bruto is cut entirely from the anime version of Battle Tendency and will dearly be missed. Hey, you know what would be so funny? If I dropped another guest entry on you? This next guest entry is read off by my friend Jtastic VA. He's a voice actor, video editor, VTuber, a lot of things. And he's gonna be talking about something very special to my heart. Take it away, Jay. Wilson Phillips is Mario. In the English language dub of the 1993 Stardust Crusaders OVA, the character of Senator Wilson Phillips, expert politician and notorious vehicular homicide artist, is played by none other than the king of Nintendo, one Super Mario. That's right, Charles Martinet, best known for his role as Mario in, like, basically everything from Mario Teaches Typing onward, voiced our favorite United States Senator. Well, our favorite United States Senator that was responsible for mowing down hordes of innocent people in a limousine. This isn't the only character he voices in the OBA either. He also voices everyone's favorite character, Pilot B, otherwise known as one of the two members of the Speedwagon Foundation to talk on screen. Weirdly enough, these two characters would go on to be the only roles he's ever had in an anime production. That is until the recording of this video in 2022, where he voices Magenta in the English dub for the film Dragon Ball Super Superhero. But still, that's 29 years in between. 
It kind of makes you wonder whether or not he just had so much success with the video games that he found no further point in voicing more animation, or if he just really liked Jojo in particular for some reason. Well, either way, it's a shame that he didn't reprise his role in the newer adaptation, because I can only imagine how hilarious Senator Mario would have been a second time around. It's me, Mario! <laughs> Ryosuke Kabashima In a manga author's career, depending on how long it is, they'll probably have a fair few amount of editors that help them craft and refine their work. Araki's first editor, who was personally responsible for much of his growth during the first 10 years of his career, was a man named Ryosuke Kabashima. His role as editor would last from 1979 all the way to the finale of Stardust Crusaders, in chapter 265 of Jojo, which was published on April 27th of 1992. Kabashima was born in Moroan, Hokkaido in 1954, but would then later move to Tokyo at the age of two. In 1979, he joined Shueisha and was assigned to the editorial department of Weekly Shonen Jump, alongside the editor of Fist of the North Star, Nobuhiko Hore. At the time, there were only about a dozen or so people in the editorial department, with fan-favorite series Kanikuman just beginning around that time. Kabashima was somewhat unfamiliar with manga personally, particularly with jump titles, so the appeal of popular series of the time kind of escaped him. Having only been an editor for several months, he met Araki later that same year. As it turned out, Araki was having a bit of a rough patch at the start of his career. With Araki's manga submissions constantly being rejected by various publishers, he was spurred to visit Shueisha directly to look for answers to his dilemma. Kabashima had coincidentally been working at the receptionist desk that day, and was actually able to personally critique Araki's work and technical faults in person. Sensing potential in the young man, he told him to fix his pages and apply for the upcoming Tezuka Award and Araki's eventual submission, Poker Under Arms, would not only end up winning the runner-up prize, but would also end up being his first ever published manga. From that point onwards, Kabashima became Araki's primary editor, encouraging him to break the mold of popular manga at the time and pursue his passions like horror and suspense, of which Kabashima was also a big fan of. He vouched for Araki's content among the Jump's editor's skepticism and even encouraged him to travel abroad. They talked about movies and novels often, with some scary horror recommendations being shared between them frequently. Kabashima was even present for the initial Jojo brainstorming session, helping Araki come up with the name Jonathan Joestar while they were eating at a Denny's. Yeah, Araki was at a Denny's when he was like, you know what, I'm gonna make a series called Jojo's Bizarre Adventure and it's gonna be called that because the main character's name's gonna be Jojo. <laughs> Imagine being a Rocky's waiter at this Denny's. Would you like fries with your shake, sir? Oh, no thanks. I'm coming up with one of the most influential manga of the 21st century. Like what? Later on during the development of Jojo during parts two and three, they would ironically meet up at a place called Jonathan's Family Restaurant. Now I know what you're thinking, and a lot of other people have thought it too, but no. Jonathan's name does not actually come from Jonathan's Family Restaurant. That is just actually a misconception that has been spread around online. Araki himself actually confirmed that this wasn't the case. Jonathan's Family Restaurant does in fact exist, and Araki and Kabashima did actually dine there, but they actually did that later during the development of parts two and three. Jonathan's Family Restaurant was actually closer to Araki's workplace at the time, so it just made sense. But yeah, um, <laughs> jo JoJo's Bizarre Adventure was first thought of in a Denny's. <laughs> It's because of information like this that I made this iceberg in the first place. I, I love learning about this stuff so much. <laughs> Kabashima would end up sticking with Jojo during its unpopular first part, defending it from cancellation by Shueisha by vouching for Araki's talents and potential, particularly coming off of the heels of his decent ratings towards the end of his previous series, Cool Shock BT. Later on, in 1987, Kabashima actually convinced Araki to go with him, albeit reluctantly, on a very special trip to Egypt. And they would go on to tour places like Italy and France as well. 
These trips would go on to inspire Araki to put in certain ideas in Part 2, and of course, Dio's appearance in Egypt in Part 3, alongside other concepts that are now staples of the JoJo franchise. Kabashima admitted that his need to make corrections for Araki rarely cropped up during the creation of Part 3, and that after stands were first introduced, the series became so insanely popular that all criticisms basically disappeared. Their relationship became much more casual and less professional during this time, simply because he had so little to take note of. Essentially, Kabashima and Araki were, were just kind of bros. Joe bros, if you will. Sadly though, Kabashima was eventually transferred from Araki to the Super Jump magazine at the end of Part 3, which would then leave Araki a bit uneasy without him. But Kabashima was confident that JoJo was a stable, strong, and popular series, and was sure that Araki could carry on making his story the best it could be. Despite leaving, he'd still oversee Araki's works for Super Jump, including various one-shots. Araki would go on to even include a final message to Kabashima marking his departure in the last chapter of Part 3, which read, I could never thank you enough, but I'd like to take this opportunity to express my gratitude. Your every word gives me courage. JoJo's Bizarre Adventure would have never existed without you. God damn it. <laughs> it's so sweet. I love this. This is my favorite fucking segment of the iceberg. Girls by Night. This entry is just porn, like no shot, it's just pornography. I swear I <laughs> I did not plan for this juxtaposition, like the last entry was so wholesome, learning about it actually made me kind of emotional, and then just boom, porn. <laughs> Oh my god! Obviously, uh, not gonna cover this at all. Like, look, I'm trying to be as thorough as possible, but we don't need to be that thorough. Nobody watching this, like, cares that I'm not being this thorough, right? Uh, unless you're a weirdo, in which case, die. So, uh, pff, I think I'm just gonna move on. Strongman Front. Back before the manga was ever officially released in China, there were a ton of pretty hilarious bootlegs. One of them was rather profoundly named Strongman Front. I feel that the crossover we deserve is definitely whoever made this and whoever is responsible for Duang. Clamp's Stoner Kekyoin as we all know by now, Clamp is notorious for their fan-made JoJo stuff. But did you know that this actually extends to their non-Dojin work? Apparently, one of the artists there, Subaki Nakoi, is a huge Jotaro Kakyoin shipper, to the point where all of their officially published boy love manga feature characters that look almost identical to Jotaro and Kakyoin. One of these Kakyoin lookalikes features a very noticeable tattoo of marijuana. <laughs> Fuck. I can't. I can't. I can't keep doing this. I can't. I can't keep reading this. This is insane. Really gives an entirely new meaning to Emerald Splash. Mercy, what the fuck? <laughs> this, this is so fucking corny. Holy shit. Marcy, Marcy wrote this, by the way. I should clarify. Marcy wrote this section. You can tell. <laughs> Fan Love Letter to Straitso During the serialization of Part 1, Araki, of course, got a lot of fan letters, like any manga artist does. And naturally, fan letters can be a little… strange sometimes. One of the strangest came in a series of letters, though, and they were all from a single girl who really, really liked Straitso for some reason. She was extremely devoted to this admittedly very minor character, and when Araki killed him off at the beginning of part two, she actually sent more letters about how horrible of a monster he was for writing it, complete with attached illustrations of presumably herself crying into Straitso's chest. You know what? It it's good to know that even in the pre-internet days, fandoms were still full of people who were absolutely out of their minds. There's something very comfort that. Joe Starstruck. 
aren't the men of the Joestar family just the dreamiest? Oh yeah, and the woman too, I, I like her. I forgot that Jolene exists, <laughs> fuck. <laughs> Loud sigh. If only there was some sort of dating sim made specifically for JoJo fans. <gasps> Holy shit! A logo! Joestar Struck is the fan-made dating sim based on the JoJo series. In it, you can go on dates with various JoJo's. Not much else to say in that department, or any department really. It's a JoJo dating sim, I, I can't really say much else than that. If it sounds up your alley, you can find it on itch.io. I actually played the pre-release demo of this pretty early on in my career on YouTube. Uh, I hate saying YouTube career, that's so fucking cringy. Can I say something else? I actually played the pre-release demo for this pretty early on in my YouTube journey on stream. If you're curious about my experience, uh, I had an enjoyable time with it. It was a weird game. <laughs> Hot pant- oh god. Hot pants cleavage. The cover of Volume 8 of Part 7 Steel Ball Run features an illustration of the character Hot Pants with her cleavage on full display. Is, is cleavage the best way to refer to this? I was so close to just saying like boobies, boobas. <laughs> The volume release using this illustration as its cover actually covers up her chest rather conveniently with its placement of the series logo. She is a nun after all, let's show some decency here fellas. I do not care how hot her pants are, stop leering! This is a steel ball run, not a blue ball run, let's pack it up guys, go home! I don't know. Need- <laughs> Oh my god! Why? Why do I get the weirdest ones to read today? Need, <laughs> Need strong pillar GF. <laughs> Apparently, there was once a concept for a pillar woman for part 2 of JoJo, rather than just having pillar men. Naturally, of course, this led to the mimetic evolution of JoJo fans simping for yet another choice wife, of whom we, uh, didn't actually have a real name. So strong pillar GF would have to do. And to be completely fair, yeah, she could crush me. And I'd be okay with that, right, John? Uh, I bet if somebody out there listening has the name John, they, they were so scared right now, they were like, whoa, whoa, oh my god, what? Uh, but, you know, uh, it's it's not real, it, it, it's a joke. Uh, anyway, <laughs> moving on. Okay, so we have another guest entry coming up, read off by Bumbles McFumbles about a thing called Choro Kichi. However, I need to put this disclaimer here because I know that there's going to be people in the comments that point this out. Uh, God knows there's already been a bunch with all the mispronunciations throughout this video series. Bumbles is about to say Gwes's name incorrectly. I repeat, Bumbles is about to refer to Gwes as Gwes. Now when that happens, I need you to not panic. It will be okay. I promise you, we will get through this together. Now prep yourself, get ready, here it comes, Choro Kichi. In part 6, the character Gwes always gives cute little nicknames to the people she shrinks down with her stand Goo Goo Dolls. These nicknames don't really translate very well to English, however, so many of them are simply left out of the English scans of the manga, as well as the dub. That being said, it's fairly simple to explain. The male guard that she shrinks down into a parakeet is nicknamed Pai-chan, which is a bit of a girly nickname. Inversely, Jolene, who is made to shrink down inside of a rat, is nicknamed Chorokichi, which itself is a sort of boyish rat nickname. And honestly, being shrunk into a dead animal carcass is one thing, but I will not have you patronizing me with inaccurate nicknames. Stop it, it's really uncalled for. No Abandon. Shonen Jump Magazine is, of course, a magazine. Wow, I... Such thoughtful commentary. And as with all good magazines, you have to create some attractive, eye-catching text to draw people into whatever it is you're trying to get them to read, to buy, or both. It seems that back during JoJo's weekly run, the editors knew this, and had a lot of fun coming up with ridiculous and often over-the-top taglines for each new chapter. These taglines, of course, were only printed in magazine releases, never making it into individual tankabons similarly to other serialized jump manga. 
Given JoJo's length and history, some of these taglines are pretty hard to find nowadays, compared to recent releases of the magazine that are both current and simultaneously made available on the internet. Some examples of particularly wacky titles include The Return of Charisma Those enchanting eyes are driving me crazy! She's Jolene, daughter to a noble soul! Gravity, the means to love! And of course, the header for this century, No Abandon. If you expect me to uh, dive into what No Abandon means, I don't know. So we're going to move on. I'm, I'm allowed to throw my hands up sometimes and just admit that I, I don't know something or, or it doesn't make any sense. I don't have to go on a, a 40 minute diatribe about what No Abandon means, okay? Moving on. Beta Colored Scans. Much like any popular shonen series, newer digitally colored scans of JoJo's manga have been being made for ages. For one reason or another, I've seen multiple people claim that these are fan-made, but uh, no. These are totally official. At least, however, the original Japanese versions. We've never gotten them officially licensed in English. And it's very much a shame. These professionally colored manga look incredible. They're the same ones I've used for the video because they look so great and are very easily readable. In general, the colored scans are pretty well known online. But did you know that it wasn't the first example of an official attempt by Shueisha to colorize JoJo manga material? Back when Steel Ball Run was Steel Ball Running, they made tons of animated Flash videos to promote it, with some of them featuring early colored scans before they were released by JoJo D. These colored scans include some notable differences to their official final counterparts, such as Dirty Deeds Done Dirt Cheap being red and Ticket to Ride being golden. Of course, given the lax nature of JoJo's color schemes as stated by Araki himself, this could just be a logical extension of that philosophy. So who am I to tell you that D4C can't be red? If Sonic's arms can be blue, then truly anything is possible. Great, we're here. Oh. Jotaro slash Kakyoin Horse Dojin. Mmm. <laughs> Hope you're ready for this. I hate this. Before you say anything, yes, this is exactly what you probably think it's gonna be. But before we talk about that, before we even step foot into this proper, I want to weave you a short little tale. I want to tell you a story about how I majorly fucked up. And I think the best way to start is at the very beginning of the creation of this video. Okay, you see, me and my co-writer Marcy have more or less split this project in half, with each of us taking on different entries of the iceberg to research and write about. And given that it started as solely my project, I took on the duty of dealing her a few lists of subjects that she needed to work on. However, on one of those lists, I accidentally left this subject on it. The Jotaro slash Kakyoin horse dojin. And I'm gonna be real with you. If you haven't put two and two together yet, this topic is very not safe for work. It was because of this fact that I had planned to tackle this subject by myself. You know, I'll put myself through it so nobody else has to, but uh, I'm an idiot and I accidentally sent it to Marcy. I accidentally threw Marcy into the deepest end of the darkest pool you could ever imagine. A doujin in which Kakyoin and Jotaro are soulmates who get reincarnated into a new life where Kakyoin is still a human and Jotaro is now a horse? for some reason? And of course, because they still have past fondness for each other, they participate in various activities, none of which I can speak of, or that I want to speak of. <sighs> So, instead of writing up a five-page explanation about what it is and giving you a full analysis that makes me the most demonetized person on YouTube, I'm gonna simply just read you the message that Marcy left for me after I accidentally traumatized her. <clears throat> you made me see this. You made me see Kakyoin and Horse Tarot consummate their hideous equestrian relationship. 
This is worse than possibly anything I could have ever hoped to see today. I've seen so many things while writing for this, and none of them, none of them, top this. I mean, they certainly don't top like Horse Jotaro does. Oh Jesus, why did I write that? Please, please, oh God, please make this stop. Please go, go to the next entry, go, and then Marcy died. And that was video three of a four part series. Thank you guys for watching. If you haven't checked out the original two videos of this four part series that are out yet, they are linked right now on screen. I'm not going to take up too much of your time. I'm really tired and I got to get to work on the next one. So bye.